thank you for listening to The Real Deal with Damian Adams. This is real sports talk for the real sports fan. And I definitely appreciate all you real sports fans who are listening right now. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, I definitely appreciate you. And please let your friends know about the podcast. Share it. Put out a bad signal. Do something to let your friends know about the podcast because they should enjoy it too. Don't be selfish. If you like it, share it. All right. And also give that five star review. That one, two, three, four, fifth. That five star rating and review would definitely be appreciated. If you're listening on the three point conversion station on Spreaker Radio, thank you. We appreciate you as well. The three point conversion station is where fans' opinions matter. So let us know what you think of the podcast. If you got constructive criticism, let me know. You know, I want to get better and I would appreciate the critiques. But please be constructive. Don't go too hard on me. I am a sensitive soul. But if you love the show, don't be constructive. Let us know how you really feel. Just go all out with all your love and let everybody know how you feel about the show. And today I'm very excited about today's show because we're doing the 2017 Real Deal NFL Awards. We're also going to break down the wildcard matchups for this weekend and do forgotten players at the end. And I couldn't do this by myself. And since this is called the Real Deal Awards, who was better to bring in than my Real Deal brother? He's been on the show before. You've heard his voice. You know him. How you doing today, Courtney? I'm doing good, man. Again, Happy New Year to you and everyone listening in as well. I'm just glad to be here. Thank, like I said, thanks for um, letting me come on the show. Definitely, man. I appreciate you coming on. It's always great sports conversation when you come on. You're very knowledgeable. And I love listening to your show because you do great interviews. You also have guests on. You know, I'm not going to say all your guests, you know, are as good as you are. They have the, the the great knowledge that you have, but you always have great guests on, you know, including myself. I'm not going to, you know, tap myself on the back too much, but I think I'm a good guest. And you, you, oh, have, yeah, <laughs> and you always have good guests on the show. And when people listen to The Real Deal with Courtney Harden, where can you listen to it at, and what can they expect when they listen? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, you've been on the show many times. Uh, we've done uh, boxing roundtables, and we've done uh, NBA preview and NFL preview. And uh, so, I appreciate you always coming on the show. Uh, you can find the show on blogtalkradio.com slash momentum shift. Uh, you can also check it out on goingfor2.com slash momentum shift. Uh, it's a couple uh, places where you can tune in and listen to afterwards after the show. And uh, you can follow it at Get The Real Deal on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So you can just check that out um, on Saturdays um, at noon. As you said, I have a lot of uh, great guests. I just reach out, just try to find interesting people in uh, media or if I can get a, you know anybody in sports or entertainment. I uh, just like to try to reach out on Twitter. So you can always uh, reach me anywhere if you want to be a part of the show. Just a conversational show, give you the real deal. And as you said, like your show, gives, give you the real deal uh, for the real sports fans. So, uh, yeah, so you can definitely check that out. Saturdays at noon on Blog Talk Radio and going for 2.com. Definitely, man. I'm a big fan of the show. I'm telling you guys, check it out. If you're a sports fan, you'll love the show. Now, let's get into some of these awards we're going to give out today. For people that know me, I like to give out unconventional type of awards for the NFL <laughs> NBA. And for the NFL, we're going to start with the defensive young pups. Basically, defensive player of the year, what I call it, the defensive young pup, the scrappy do award, if you will. So, <laughs> for the scrappy do award, the defensive rookie of the year, who do you have in the NFL? Uh, I think it came down to two people. I think it came down to Tredavious White and uh, Marshawn Lattimore from your New Orleans Saints. And I think Lou Lattimore uh, should get it. I think he should be the winner. I mean, this guy, as a cornerback, came in as a as a rookie and played well. I mean, basically they, they turned the New Orleans Saints uh, season around just with his play. I mean, he would take half the field and shut that side down. I mean, he had that Richard Sherman, Deion Sanders, that type of, even though Deion didn't just play on one side, Deion would move around. But Deion, would, he actually would shut down half a field too. Um, so, I, uh, you know, he, he's played well. He's led the Saints to the playoffs. 
and turn that defense around because in the beginning of the year, as you know, they were on, a, on another pace of being a very bad defensive team. Uh, but now after, after he got some games under him, and he just they just play he played at a Pro Bowl uh, caliber football. I think he actually made the Pro Bowl as a rookie too. So I give it to Marshawn Lattimore as defensive rookie of the year. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm glad you said it first because now it doesn't seem like I'm being a homer. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but even if I wasn't a Saints fan, you have to recognize the impact he's had on that defense. You talk about a defense last year that was just pitiful. You know, couldn't stop right. a nosebleed. And this year, Marshawn Lattimore, with his versatility, has made a defense as versatile as he is. When you think about you have a cornerback who can, like you said, shut down one side of the field or play man-to-man on whoever you put him on, that makes it so much easier for your defense to do different things. Now you don't have to sit in zone the whole game. Now you can play man-to-man and also set up some exotic-type blitzes. You can go into zone sometimes and just confuse the defense, switch it up. There's so many different things you can do because you have a cornerback like Lattimore and also Ken Crawley as well, not to leave him out. He's had a really good year at corner for the Saints as well. Two very young yeah. cornerbacks who, because of them, it opens up the the game for the, the sackers, the defensive ends. Now Cameron Jordan is being noticed for how elite he is. He's been an elite defensive end in this league for a long time, but he's been on horrible defense. A lot of people didn't know about him. But because of these cornerbacks being able to play man-to-man, now you have a little more time to rush the quarterback. And you have your defense lineman getting noticed like Cameron Jordan. So Marshawn Lattimore, we agree on that for the Scrappy Duo Award, the defense of Rookie of the Year. So now it's time to move on to our next one. We're going to stay with the rookies, stay with the young guns. We're going to call it the Young Gunner, the Offensive Rookie of the Year. Who is your winner for the Young Gunner Award? I think it goes to uh, another one of your Saints players. I'm going to go with Alvin Kamara. Uh... This guy, I mean, he's the the second running back, and you know he he just he he he's been a lightning rod for that that offense. He's been a big, huge playmaker uh, for how he's been pretty productive, and he has the small role in the offense as well. I mean, he only had 201 touches on offense, uh, but they resulted in 15 over 1500 yards and 13 touchdowns. That's production. That's big play production. So that one two punch uh, that that he's that he's in. Um, and he's a, he's an ultimate weapon out of the backfield. Um, you know, he can catch out of the backfield. He can run between the tackles. Speed, just all-purpose yards that he produces. I uh, give him the Office of Rookie of the Year. And this was a hard one because if Deshaun Watson was healthy, I think he would have won it because he was on pace to really uh, play. He was playing well. Uh, he had Dalvin Cook, Kareem Hunt. Um, so there was a lot. Juju Smith Schuster. There was so many rookies this year. Leonard Fournette um, that definitely exceeded expectations. A very good rookie class, but uh, I think Kamara um, was a, a head above shoulders out of, out, of, out of everybody. Yeah, again, we agree on this one. Like I said, I'm glad you're saying it first because it makes it seem like I'm being more objective. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but with Alvin Kamara, once he started getting more touches, you saw the impact immediately. You know, at the beginning of the year, we had Adrian Peterson, which seems like years ago now, but Adrian Peterson was a saint. And <laughs> it was yeah. it was hard to get a rhythm with having three talented backs. So it wasn't that Adrian Peterson, you know, didn't have it anymore. He proved that once he went to the Cardinals and just went off his first few games there. But the fact that our offense is set up for multiple packages and Alvin Kamara's versatility is great for our offense. You saw it right away. And that's why even, you know, only starting three games, but, you know, playing in playing in all 16 this year, but he had one game was real short when he got hurt against Atlanta. He still, have, you know, happened to get 728 yards rushing, eight touchdowns, averaging 6.1 yards per attempt, which led the NFL, which is bananas. Like a good yards per carry is four, 4.2, 4.3. He has 6.1. That's crazy. And for receptions, he had 81 receptions on 100 targets. That's a big thing to me because a lot of receivers might get a lot of receptions, but they have a million targets. You know, they're only catching half the time they're getting the ball. This guy caught it 81% of the time and he was targeted. That's crazy. 826 yards, 10.2 yards per attempt on passes as well with five touchdowns. That versatility is something else, man. And it's made the Saints offense just, 
even more dangerous than it has been in previous years. Even with Drew Brees not having his normal type of year, you know, only throwing for, you know, I believe it was a little bit over 4,000 yards this year, even though he, you know, normally close to 5,000, if not eclipsing 5,000. And with the versatility of Ingram and Kamara, it made our offense so much more balanced and better this year because of that. So Alvin Kamara is definitely the Young Gunner Award winner this year. So now let's move on to the Toss That Thing Award. Now, for people who don't know why I call it Best QB the Toss That Thing Award, there was a speech by Jameis Winston, right? Jameis Winston went to Florida State. And was a great quarterback there. And he went back one year just to, you know, was watching the game. And in halftime, he gave the halftime speech. And Jameis now is now known for funny halftime speeches because of the whole eat the W thing. But <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but when he was talking to Florida State, he had a, a line where he just, all the country came out of him. And he was like, we got a good coach. We got a good defense. We got a quarterback that's going to toss that thing. And I was like... <laughs> And I was like, after I heard that, I was like, my best QB award forever will be named the Toss That Thing Award. So, <laughs> so who is your winner for the Toss That Thing Award? Yeah, no, I like that. I like when Winston does that. He does those those speeches, man, and half the players don't even be listening to him. <laughs> They're like, who is this guy, you know? But, uh, yeah, for that, to- that Toss That Thing Award, best quarterback, even though he's missed the last three games, of two and a half games of the year, three games of the year, I got to go with Carson Wentz. I mean, this guy had 33 touchdowns and seven interceptions only in 13 games, 12 and a half games until, you know, blow towards ACL. So I, I got to give it to, to my guy, Carson Wentz. Uh, he was just unbelievable in the second year uh, this season. Led the Eagles. I mean, the Eagles finished 13 and three. Um, and he, they were 11 and two with him in the lineup. So uh, they were they were the number one seed. They finished as the number one seed uh, going into the playoffs, with the best record in, in the uh, NFL. And uh, Wentz, he was a playmaker. He made things happen. When things broke down, he used his legs. Uh, he was doing some Houdini acts <laughs> for the most part. I mean, he was he was just unbelievable this year. Now, it doesn't take away from what Tom Brady did. Jared Goff had a great year. Case Keenum had a great year. Russell Wilson. So, I mean, this could have went to a lot of different uh, players. But I got to give it to my guy Carson Wentz of the Philadelphia Eagles, even though missing, still missing three games. He still led the – I think he led the league in touchdown passes. Uh, or he was still up there in the top. So, yeah, I got to go with Carson Wentz as my uh, best QB of the year. Yeah, I can't, I can't knock you for that for that that choice, you know, because Carson Wentz is definitely the reason that the Eagles, you know, stay at the number one seed right now and have home field throughout the NFC playoffs. And like you mentioned, has such a great TD to interception ratio this year. And if he would have played the full year, he would have finished with the lead in touchdowns. I think Russell Wilson passed him up yesterday and has 34. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't argue with that one. Now, my choice for the Toss That Thing Award, I had to go with the old man, Tom Brady. Yep. Tom Brady having another awesome season. He was first in passing yards this year with 4,577. He had 32 touchdowns, only eight interceptions, completed 66% of his passes, and led the New England Patriots to the number one seed in the AFC. And you just wonder, when will it stop? You know, it's like him and LeBron, I don't know if they just got some magic dust or something, but they just seem, <laughs> <laughs> they just seem not to age at all. You know, you just wonder how they do it. Now, Tom, we'll see in the playoffs, man. It seems like he was slowing down a little bit in December as far as the stats. We'll see if that affects him in January, but it seems like in January that's when he really comes alive. This now, you know, nowadays that that's when he really does come alive and has the best stats when it's really that time for it when it's clutch time. So Tom Brady is my winner for that toss that thing award. But like I said, I have no no problems with Carson Wentz getting the award either. So now let's move on to the Carry the Rock Award, and this is for the best running back. Who do you have as your winner for the Carry the Rock Award? This came down to two, Le'Veon Bell and Todd Gurley, but I'll have to go with uh, Todd Gurley. I mean, he didn't even play in uh, yesterday's uh, game loss to the 49ers, and he just he just was my he just put up a mind boggling numbers. I mean, this guy just. He just had a, a, an unbelievable year, finished with over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, 19 touchdowns, which both led the league. 
Um, and they, they, he led he led the Rams attack with Jared Goff. And as we said, that we talked about you know teams that kind of jumped up. They were they were one of the teams, the Rams, and now they're in the playoffs uh, as a third seed. And I got to give it yes, I got to give it to. Um, Todd Gurley as the best running back in football. He was just an absolute workhorse. He led that attack. They were explosive. He could catch out of the backfield, run between the tackles. Uh, he just made a world of difference for that offense. And uh, so, yeah, every time they give it to him, he just he made a play every single time. So I think Todd Gurley was the best running back in football. Yeah, we're on the same page when it comes to Carry the Rock Award. You think about Todd Gurley, man. I think he's the key to that whole offense. When he's running the rock, they're able to do play action with Jared Goff going down the field because of it. It just opens up everything. You mentioned that he even played in the last game. He still finished with 1,305 yards rushing, 13 rushing touchdowns was first in the league, had 4.7 yards per carry, which is really good. Like, don't get fooled by the Alvin Kamara 6.1. That's, you know, crazy. <laughs> it's not normal. 4.7. <laughs> 4.7 is really good, and the fact that he runs the ball as much as he does and still averages that many yards per carry is phenomenal. He had 64 receptions this year for 788 yards, six touchdowns. And when he first came in the league, I don't think that him catching the ball at the backfield so much was something that they thought they would have. I thought they just thought they would have maybe a workhorse, you know, somebody like Adrian Peterson type. But we didn't know he was this versatile. And with him being this versatile, it just makes the game so much better for the Rams. So Ty Gurley is our winner for the Carry the Rock Award. So now it's time for us to give out the Throw Me the Damn Ball Award. Now, <laughs> people may be familiar with the term Throw Me the Damn Ball. Shout out to Keyshawn Johnson. He even wrote a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he even wrote a book called Throw Me the Damn Ball. Your wide receivers usually have that mentality where they believe if you get them the ball, they can win the game for you. And that's why you got to respect receivers for that. So that's why the best receiver award is called the Throw Me the Damn Ball Award. So who's your winner for the Throw Me the Damn Ball Award? I have this one. I have Antonio Brown. I got, now we picked, I picked Carson Wentz, another guy that got injured. Antonio Brown, also a, uh, one of the players that got a lot of injuries in the in this season. This, this was a weird year. A lot of superstars went down, and Antonio Brown was one of those one of those guys. But he still finished the season with a 101 catches, over 1,500 yards, 89 touchdowns in 14 games. I also added 11 uh, punt returns for 60 yards. So you talk about an all-around player, a play, a playmaker, a game breaker. Uh, Antonio Brown. I, I, I just always believe it's between him and Julio Jones. Odell Beckham, to a certain extent, he's up there too. But I think those guys are the best receivers in football. And I think Antonio Brown. He just continues to keep. Uh, producing numbers and he gets open. It's like he's open every time. Every time he, get, you know, he's on the field, he's open. <laughs> it's like, how can you stop this guy? He, he cuts. He can, you know, run runs great routes, and he has great chemistry with uh, Ben Roethlisberger. It's gonna be interesting to see how he does if Big Ben does retire after this season. But uh, yeah, with Brown out with the leg injury, who knows? If he's gonna come back for the playoffs. I I, I can't see him. Uh, coming back from, with that calf injury, but he had a, another unbelievable year. He was on pace to get over 50, 1,800 yards uh, receiving again. So, I, yeah, I definitely have Antonio Brown as the best wide receiver. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Antonio Brown's absolute beast. I think what separates him from Julio Jones is consistency. We all yeah. know Julio Jones is a monster. He's a monster who can go and get you 250 yards, 300 yards receiving in a game. Literally, like I'm not exaggerating, that's happened. This man has gotten 300 yeah. yards <laughs> receiving in a single game. It's crazy. But once he gets that 250, 300 yard type game, it seems like he regresses back. And then for like four or five straight games, he's getting 50 yards, 60 yards, maybe 70 here. With Antonio Brown, consistently he's getting you 100 yards receiving, 10 catches every game. No matter what the coverage is, no matter what they decide to do, he's getting you those stats. And Ben knows this guy is open all the time. Like you said, it seems like there's nothing you could do to stop this guy because he's so fast and such a good route runner. And he's not that big. Like Julio Jones is a physical freak. You know, To be yeah. as, as big and as fast as he is, it's crazy. Like him and Calvin Johnson, to be that big and that fast and that agile is just crazy. I think they're probably the two. They might be two of the greatest athletes ever. you got to include Randy Moss in that conversation when you talk about wide receivers. But Antonio Brown, he's what, 5'10 on a good day? 
you know. (laughs) For him to be able to dominate at his size shows you how great his technique is. You have to have great technique to get open at that size. Of course, speed matters. He does have great speed, but great technique. And also, when they're in a bind, he can punt return for you and be somebody who makes damage in a special teams game. So Antonio Brown's an absolute monster, man. And before he got hurt, he had 101 receptions for... 1,533 yards and nine touchdowns this year. Absolutely crazy. Somebody who was in consideration for being the first MVP as wide receiver, which would have been absolutely nuts to finally break that barrier for wide receivers and get the MVP award. But unfortunately, you got hurt. So now let's move on to the Bill Walsh Award. Now, Bill Walsh was a great coach in the NFL, somebody who's known for the West Coast system that we still see a lot today. And that's why I named the Best Coach Award after him. Who do you have as your Bill Walsh Award winner? This one, um, this one was a little tough. I know there's there's a lot of good candidates. Um, just to name a few, I mean, you had Doug Peterson. Um, you can always still go with Bill Belichick. I mean, there was there was a couple of uh, great coaches um, that that did unbelievable jobs. But I gotta go with the young guy. I gotta go with Sean McVay for the Rams as uh, Coach of the Year. He led the Rams. I, I think they were one of the teams that. We knew they were going to improve, but we just didn't know how much. And this guy's, what, 31 years old? And he takes a team from being one of the worst in the division to the top of the division. And that's the division with the, the Seattle Seahawks, who, who've run that division for over the last, what, four or five years. You know, he had Arizona in there as well. So I knew the Rams were going to be good, but we didn't know how good and how good he was going to be. He came in with, a, you know, a lot of expectations, great offensive of mind. He has Wade Phillips as a defensive uh, coordinator. I think Wade Phillips is uh, an exceptional uh, defensive uh, coordinator and and coach. Uh, And so he had that. He had him to lean on. But to come in at that young of an age, I mean, he's I'm older than he is. (laughs) So it's like this guy got a job and turned him around. Uh, got the, the Jeff Fisher ghost out of there. That terrible, uh, that terrible uh, season that he had there, and he turned him around, got them into the playoffs, and they're one of the favorites to come out of the, uh, the NFC. So I gotta go with uh, Sean McVay as coach of the year. Yeah, again, we're on the same page with this one. You talk about Sean McVay, man. I think I saw him last night at the club. You know, he just got old enough to get in, so <laughs> he just, right now. Right? <laughs> so he was in there celebrating, you know, his twenty first birthday, but. <laughs> But when you have, we talk about Sean McVay, just looking at some of the differences from 2016 to 2017 for the Rams. 2016, they went 4-12. and They were 32nd in points scored. This year, they went 11-5 and and were 1st in points scored. To go from 32nd in points scored to 1st in points scored with the, the same roster. Like, that offense is pretty much the same. You, had, you added Sammy Watkins, but all the other weapons around are still the same. And you were able yeah. to captivate that offense into the best offense in the league, points-wise. That's crazy. And he's known for offense, but defensively, they improved as well. Defensively, same, pretty much the same roster. They went from 23rd in points allowed in 2016 to 12th in points allowed in 2017. Absolutely nuts to improve that much over one season with a new head coach. Sean McVay, man, is definitely the, the winner right there for the Bill Walsh Award Best Coach in the NFL. Speaking of Jeff Fisher... It's time for us to give out the Jeff Fisher Award. The Jeff, <laughs> the Jeff Fisher Award is the award for the worst coach in the NFL. So this is not an award you want, but it's an award that we have to give out. We have to keep it real. This is the real deal. Got my real deal brother on here, and we got to keep it real. So who is your winner for the Jeff Fisher Award? Oh, man, there was a lot of bad coaches. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting that you said the Jeff Fisher Award and – Today is Black Monday for the worst coaches in football that, you know, they're getting fired. I don't condone people losing their jobs or anything like that, but this is the NFL. It's professional sports. If you don't produce, you get you get fired. So there's the Black Monday of coaches. So we've already had a couple of coaches uh, fired or retired already. So, but I, I think, I don't think this is close. I know there's a lot of bad coaches, but, and I don't know, understand how he got, um, you know, they're, they're bringing him back next year. For the only 16 Cleveland Browns, I got to go with Hugh Jackson. I, I think he's the, he's the worst coach. He had the worst record, and this this the worst coach. Now a lot of they're, they're saying, well, you know, they don't have enough talent. 
well, you guys had a lot of draft picks. You messed up. You're just a bad run organization. And he's part of it. In the last two years, his record is one and thirty-one. <laughs> I mean, I gotta repeat that: one and thirty-one <laughs> in the last two years, and he still has a job. I, I just don't understand it. I, they, they give him the support. He has a long leash. I, I, I wish we, you know, we, if we produced those type of records like that, if we were coaches, we would have. They would have fired him. They probably would have fired him last year. And now to bring him back, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I understand he hasn't found his quarterback yet. They've been through the ringer of quarterbacks. Uh, really, no offensive weapons uh, to, to speak of. You know, and you know, defensively they're trying to build, but. They don't have no direction. I, 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 I really don't know. They got a number one pick and a number four pick in this year's draft again. It's, it's unbelievable. But yeah, I think Hugh Jackson uh, is the, was the worst coach, um, especially the last two seasons. Yeah, that's. I can't really argue with that at all. Only thing I would say for Hugh Jackson is that a lot of people say it's the front office that didn't let him. Mm-hmm pick his players that he wanted. Now, they have some talented players. If Miles Garrett has shown that he's probably going to be right, a, a right. beast at defensive end, Jabril Peppers looks like he's going to be really good. You got Josh Gordon back, who looks like he's finally clean and ready to go, and we know how much of a monster he can be. So if you can find that quarterback, we've seen in San Francisco, they got a quarterback. It changed the whole culture of the program. So when, yeah. you, ha- when you have a quarterback, it changes everything. And Hugh Jackson is known as that quarterback whisperer. Now, if they believe Deshaun Kaiser is the guy, Maybe you give him another year. He is. He was a rookie. We can't forget that. Like he had a, a bad year, but he was a rookie. A lot of rookies have had a bad years. Peyton Manning still holds a record for rookie interceptions, and he's a Hall of Famer, a future Hall of Famer. So you have to give quarterbacks time, and not every quarterback's gonna come in and kill it right away. Everybody's not gonna be Dak Prescott and kill it right away. And sometimes when you kill it right away, you have that sophomore slump. Speaking of Dak Prescott, where the second year is where you run into those obstacles that you may have run into that first year. So for me, I'm not going to go with Hugh Jackson because I wasn't expecting Cleveland to do much anyway. The coach I'm going to go with is somebody who I feel like let his team down as a coach. And this team was somebody we expected to be good. They were all on hard knocks. We was like, oh, this team going to be nice. <laughs> I ain't going to lie, I fell for the hard knocks bug. I was like, oh, man, they in my division. I'm a Saints fan, but Tampa Bay's in my division. I'm like, oh, they're going to be tough this year. And they showed their talent in the game against Sunday where we're like, okay, this is the Tampa Bay we expected. They beat the Saints, came back from behind, last second type fashion. This is the Tampa Bay we expected all year. Where was that team? And they did have injuries with Jameis, but that defense, no excuse to be that bad. So my coach for the Jeff Fisher Award is Dirk Cutter. You think about Dirk Cutter, man. In 2016, they went 9-7. and seven, And they were one game out the playoffs. We're like, okay, Tampa Bay's coming. And like I mentioned, you saw hard knocks. You're like, okay, this team is ready. They picked up players like Brent Grimes, who's still a really good cornerback at his age. Deshaun Jackson, who's still really good at his age as well. So you pick up veterans who can still play. You have that young nucleus that you already had there who helped you to the 9-7 and seven year. Why would you regress? I understand how regression happened. You have a capable backup. Even when you had James Winston hurt, Ryan Fitzpatrick is a capable backup. So you had players there to win. But for some reason, they were... 22nd at points, they went from 22nd at points allowed in 2016 to 32nd at points allowed in this year, 2017. That's unacceptable. And the fact that he's getting such a long leash kind of boggles the mind as well because Lovey Smith, who was a coach before him, only got two years. And he was making progress. He went from two wins to six wins. And you're like, okay, this team's starting to make progress. And then Dirk Cutter came in and he went to nine wins. Okay, this is the year that it's supposed to turn over. You're supposed to make that playoff run. And they're in a very tough division in the FC South. But you have you have to make some type of progress. At least stay at the same plane when you're on this path. And he couldn't do that. So Dirk Cutter is my winner for the Jeff Fisher Award this year. Mm, that's a that's actually a good pick. And, um, and, and then now they're bringing him back as well. So maybe they, they're, they're, going, they're going to see if he can um, actually turn this around. Because like, as you said, Tampa Bay was supposed to be take that next step. Uh, just to add one more coach, uh, he's already been fired. It was Ben McAdoo from the New York Giants. I think he could have been uh, in that category as well as one of the worst coaches. He's not even in the league now. So uh just want to add, add that. Sorry, Giants fans. Had to, had to, you know, put a little dagger into you guys too. But McAdoo, the, the way he um, handled the Eli Manning situation and uh, and everything and with his slick back hair and 
<laughs> 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 like, come on, man. And then, and then, you know, he had that ego, and then they were terrible this year. So, yeah, he, I mean, he, he gets some consideration as the worst coach in the league. Definitely, he's up there. You know, he he already been kicked enough, so I just <laughs> didn't mention his name. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's definitely probably the worst coach. Yeah, he was you know only the only coach to get fired before the last game, I believe. And usually you'll have yeah. more more coaches than that, but he was the only one. Of course, you got to mention Jack Del Rio as well with Oakland taking such a step back. There's a lot of coaches this year who could have fit the bill for worst coach of the year, the Jeff Fisher Award. So. Now it's time for us to give out the award for most surprising team. And this is surprising in a good way. The team that you didn't expect to be good, but turned out to be pretty good. What's your pick for most surprising team? Well, we talked about uh, we talked about them earlier in the show with the uh, coach uh, McVay, uh, Todd Gurley, uh, Jared Goff. I, I got to go with the Rams. I mean, as you said, they went from 4-12 to third in the NFC. And one of the favorites to come out of the NFC. I think that right there was an improvement in itself. Last in offense, last season to first in scoring offense. I mean, they their expectations. We knew they were going to be a little bit better, but we didn't. I, I didn't at least didn't think they were going to be this good this soon with that young coach. Uh, he turned them around. Um, he was he was much better, way better than what Jeff Fisher ever did uh, for that team. And Jeff Fisher tried to take credit for that team. Yes, you you got a lot of those players. You drafted some of a lot of those players, but your system didn't work. Sean McVay comes in, new system, new coach, uh, very young coach. And he has these guys playing. Got Wade Phillips, smart move. Got the defense uh, turned around. They're making plays. Uh, Aaron Donald, who is arguably maybe the best defensive player in football, with J.J. Watt being out over the last couple of years. Uh, And, you know, Aaron Donald, he sat out most of the preseason because of the contract. He still wants a new contract. But you see the impact he has. So I gotta go with the uh, the L.A. Rams. I think they definitely are the one of the, one of these, if not the most surprised team this season. Yeah, that's a very good pick. Like you said, no one expected them to be this good. We all expected a turnaround. We figured their offense would be better under Sean McVay, but to go from four and twelve to eleven and five, and you pretty much gave up the last game because you didn't really want to play. That's incredible. It's an incredible turnaround. So L.A. Rams is a really good pick for most surprising team. Angle, I went homer pick on this one. Most surprising team, New Orleans Saints. And the reason I picked the Saints is, even as a Saints fan, I didn't expect us to be this good. I was hopeful, but I knew we were going to depend on a lot of young players. And that's the key to the Saints. They had such a great draft class. You mentioned We mentioned Marshawn Latimer earlier and Alvin Kamara. So we have a legit shot of getting both the defensive and offensive rookie of the year, which is crazy. I don't know if that's happened before. And also in that draft class, you got Ramchek, who's our right tackle, who's been playing well this year. Offensive line's been great, even with a lot of injuries, shifting everybody around. Because you have somebody like Ramchek, you have a great right tackle. And then you also have Williams, our safety, who was in this draft as well. Had two interceptions yesterday. Great up-and-coming player. Ken Crawley, who's not a rookie, but a second-year player, who was an undrafted player that we picked up last season. Another young player that we're depending on. We have so many young players that stepped up for us. We didn't expect to be this good this fast. And I'm glad that we're doing it before Drew Brees is out the door. So now we have the L.A. Rams and New Orleans Saints as our most surprising teams. Two good picks right there. But now it's time to get a little dark. Who who is your most disappointing team? Now, this, this question, when you presented this question yesterday, I thought, man, there's so many disappointing teams. I mean, I could go from the Cowboys, and uh, I could go from to, uh, you know, Tampa Bay, Oakland. I mean, there's so many teams, the New York Giants. Uh, they, you know, these teams had high expectations to be near the top or the best teams, and there was a lot of hype going on with a, uh, a couple of these teams. But I got to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You mentioned, you know, they was on hard knocks. They were picked for some to get to the Super Bowl. I, I didn't go that far, but I thought they were going to improve 
a, a tremendously, but they took a huge step back. As you said, Dirk Cutter, we talked, you talked about him with, you know, the coaching. He seemed like he lost control of the team. There was a lot of infighting and just, it was almost like they were just running around with no direction at all. So, yeah, I got to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think there was so much expectations uh, for them to, to at least make the playoffs. And they disappointed in a tough division, very tough division, but they, they definitely disappointed. So I got to go with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as the most disappointing team this season. That's a very good pick. I thought about Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And there was another team who's on that same type of path as the Buccaneers. They made the playoffs last year, this team that I'm about to mention, and this year we're not close. I'm talking about the Oakland Raiders. The Oakland Raiders last year, before Derek Carr's injury, were a team that we were like, okay, maybe this team can make some noise in the playoffs. Of course, after that injury, we knew you know they were pretty much done. Like, coming into this year, you're like, okay, you got a healthy Derek Carr. The defense should improve. You got Khalil Mack, who won defensive player of the year last year. All this talent, Crab, Tree, Cooper, this team should be good. And they came out the gate stumbling and just never recovered pretty much. And it was 12-4 and four last year, went 6-10 and 10 this year. They went from 7 in points scored and 6 in yards gained to 23rd in points scored and 17th in yards gained, which is absolutely crazy, right? How yeah. can you regress that much offensively? And then defensively, you were, weren't that good last year. And it was kind of overshadowed because the offense was so good. Then the defense didn't improve. And I think that's one of the reasons that Jack Del Rio got fired. And we're finally going to have a, J- a John Gruden hire, it seems like. We had these rumors for the past umpteen years about <laughs> John Gruden getting <laughs> hired by somebody. And it finally seems like Oakland Raiders are going to do it. And they're going to give them, I think they're saying, like part of ownership of the team. So maybe waiting out for a while for the right type of progress was something you had to do. So now we see that this team is going to be good. So now let's do our defensive player of the year. You know, like I call, I got to call it the shutdown award. Who is your <laughs> a winner for the shutdown award? I this, yeah, this one was another one that um. I was like, man, there's been some pretty good defensive players this season. I'm going to go with the, you know, the, the, my arch rival in the NFC East, Demarcus Lawrence. I mean, this guy has been a problem all season. Uh, he was, you know, he came in great shape uh, because we last year he was out of shape, um, and then he just continued just to put keep putting pressure on. The, on, you know, on offenses, you know, from the defense, they do know he had to double team him. He kept going through, finishing the job, and he's been doing his thing uh, all season. So I got to go with Demarcus Lawrence as defensive player of the year. That's a very good pick. The only reason I didn't go with Demarcus is because I believe his impact on the defense isn't as big as other players. Because <clears throat> when Demarcus is there and Sean Lee isn't, you saw how big that impact was on that defense. When Sean right, Lee right. wasn't there, man, that defense went from something to nothing, pretty much, <laughs> from riches to rags. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I went with a player who's, you didn't expect to have this good a year in this stage of his career. But he went to Jacksonville from Arizona and dominated, man. I went with Calais Campbell as my defensive player of the year, my shutdown award winner. And when you think about Calais Campbell as a defensive player of the year, he had 14 and a half sacks, 14 or 47, excuse me, solo tackles. And the fact that he's as big as he is and can move the way he moves, just to, that deserves an award in itself. 6'8", 282 pounds. Like, that's a giant, people. That is a giant <laughs> <laughs> of a, a man. basketball player, man. Power forward, center, uh, yeah. playing football. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Like, that's... The, the fact that he can move the way he can move at that size is crazy. And Jacksonville's defense has been phenomenal this year. It's one of the reasons that people believe Jacksonville can make a run. It's definitely not their quarterback. So it's their defense no. <laughs> <laughs> that we believe in. And Calais Campbell has been a big part of that. Him getting pressure on the quarterback leads to the quarter, you know, quarterback having to release the ball sooner. And that makes the job easier for their great cornerbacks than Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Bouye. So I got Calais Campbell as my defensive player of the year. But I'm not mad at the Marcus Lawrence pick either. 
and up. We talked about Aaron Donald too. I mean, he was like I said, he was uh, as a defensive tackle, unblockable, <laughs> and the racking up eleven sacks to five forced fumbles. I mean, as a defensive tackle, this guy doesn't. He's just so relentless. I could have went with him, but th- this was a more of a harder award to to name. But uh, I can't, uh, like I said, I can't fault you on Calais Campbell either. He he had a huge impact and led the Jacksonville right to the playoffs with their defense. They're the strong defense. Definitely, definitely. Now it's time for us to give out the real deal MVP award for the most valuable player. And before I get into it, I think this year, because of all the injuries, it's been a very watered down MVP race. Do you think I'm out of line by saying that? No, I I totally agree with you. Uh, as you said, it's it's been. I, I talked about this on, on my show, and I talked about it on other shows too. This this has been a really watered down league, and uh, it, it, it's so wide open. I, even the playoffs, and I know we're gonna talk about that a little later. Uh, even the, the the teams in the playoffs, that there's so many watered down teams as, as wide open, which I think is great for the NFL. But there was really Aaron Rodgers was out. Uh, you know, as we talk about J.J. Watt, all these guys, uh, impact players, Odell Beckham, impact players that, that definitely were out, and uh, Carson Wentz. So, yeah, it's definitely a watered-down um, league this season. Just a, a different – the play was was uh, terrible um, in some instances. Quarterback play, the lack of, the lack of playing, it's, it's just been a bad – pretty not a, not a great season. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But – because it's NFL, we still have to give out the most valuable player. Who do right. you have as your MVP award winner? Man, I've been going back and forth with this. Uh, and because, you know, my guy Carson Wentz, I think he would have won it hands down um, if he would have continued to play. And I could still give it to him, but I got to go with your offensive player, uh, your best quarterback, and Tom Brady. I have to uh, go with him. And he, as you said, he continues just to keep uh, playing at a high level at, at 40 years old. It's like we said, him, LeBron, Kobe, these guys play for so long, especially um, Brady. I don't know what it is. It's some type of serum that they're taking or, or something for them to play at such a high level at this point in his career. Uh, Brady, arguably, if not the greatest quarterback of all time, I think he is now. Um, and he's right there on the doorstep to win his sixth Super Bowl ring, which is a very highly likely possibility that he would win. Uh, he led the league in passing yards over, you know, he had over 4,500 4, yards and, and ranked in the top five in completion percentage, yards per attempt, passing touchdown, passer rating, and total QBR. So, uh, Todd Gurley, and, you know, he makes a great a great case. We talked about him earlier. Uh, you know, Wentz, uh, Russell Wilson, uh, Antonio Brown, but I got to give it to the, to the I got to give it to Tom Brady as the MVP. Yeah, I'm not mad at that choice right there. You think about a player who's the quarterback on the best team in the AFC, and a lot of times this comes down to the best player on the best team. Now, I was a big fan of Russell Wilson getting the award earlier on, especially if they would have made the playoffs, because Russell Wilson, man, in Seattle has been carrying his team by himself for so long. And that offensive line is not helping him at all. I've been saying for years, I think he's the best conditioned athlete in the NFL when you think about the fact that he runs around on every play. But for <laughs> 30 yards, come on, man. He runs around like at a crazy pace. But, you know, they fell short of the playoffs this year. And I don't think in the NFL, I don't think your MVP could be on a non-playoff team. Only like right. Major League Baseball can that happen. But <laughs> but for me, I'm going to go with a guy who I think does, still deserves the award after getting injured. I'm going to go with Carson Wentz, your guy. Because when you look at what he did for Philly and his impact on that team, being a you know first team in the NFC, and you see the difference with Nick Foles. You know, hopefully Nick Foles can get together for you guys, but he doesn't look like it right now. But they have a, a couple of weeks to get it you know worked out. Yeah. <laughs> his his impact is crazy. The fact that you talked about it earlier, how he was able to run around and make plays. Even in that Seattle game when they lost, some of the plays he made in that game, man, just left you just astound. You just when he made the play where I think he ran to the right and he got tackled. 
and on his way down was able to throw the ball 45 yards down the field on mark that's yeah. <laughs> it's bananas it's bananas what he was able to do hopefully he could come back from the acl injury you know better than ever man because i would you know just i'm excited for philly fans man because this guy is a beast and he's young and you got your next guy for the next 10 years and i think he still deserves the mvp award because he played 13 games it's not like he played eight you know it's not like right. with, you know deshaun watson deshaun watson of course we talked about earlier if he would have stayed healthy he would have been offensive rookie of the year but he only played what five six games yeah, With yeah. Carson Wentz, you got 13 games. You have a good sample size there to determine how successful this guy is and how much of an impact he had on the team. So I got Carson Wentz as my real deal MVP. But Tom Brady, of course, I think he's going to win the real award. You know, even though the real deal award is nice, you get a gold plated award sent to your house. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would love that Carson Wentz get the MVP, as you know. And, this, and it goes back to last year when Brady uh, was suspended for the first four games. Yeah. And, you know, he made a huge case for MVP and playing 12 games. I mean, like I said, it's not like he played only seven games, six games. He played 12 games, and he had unbelievable numbers. I think he went through like three t- interceptions, over uh, almost uh, close to 30 touchdowns. That's only we won just in 12 games, so I can't. If, if, if Wentz was to win it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, be mad at that at all. Um, I just think they, they are going, because it is Tom Brady and, so there was, you know, he said he had set the bar and the standard so high, just like his coach. And for him to get that MVP, I believe he definitely will. As you said, he led led his team to the number one seed again in the AFC, and they're probably going to the Super Bowl once again. So yeah, so I wouldn't, I can't fault you for picking Carson Wentz. I I, I thought about it. He possibly still can win it. Yeah, like I said, I hope he gets it because I believe he was. I think he was far ahead before he got hurt. And, yeah. I, and I think that with him being such a, a far ahead leader in MVP race with so many games under his belt before he got hurt, he should still get the award. We'll see, though. So now we've given out our awards. You know, you guys should let us know what you think. If you disagree, agree. But now it's time to move on to the wild card weekend. It's time to talk about these playoff games. Yeah. We have a very interesting wild card weekend coming up. Let's start with Saturday's games. First game we got is Tennessee at Kansas City. So with Tennessee at 9-7 going to 10 6 Kansas City, what do you think are the keys to this game for, let's go with both teams, let's go ahead and get your whole outlook on it. What do you think are the keys to this matchup? Uh, I think for Tennessee, uh, one of the keys to, their, to this matchup is can they establish the run? Can they get that running game I think they got to have to win very ugly because Marcus Mariota, we talk about players that took and, and you know, teams that took a step back. Marcus Mariota was supposed to be the guy, along with James Winston, to take that next step. Neither one did it. Uh, they both struggled. Um, Mariota, I know he was injured uh, earlier in the year, so but he came back and he just he hasn't looked right at all uh, throughout the year. And I don't think Tennessee's a very good team at all. They they got in Jacksonville, kind of took a step back, you know, kind of you know letting them. And the Bortles was big like Bortles. He was just, he was <laughs> just throwing interception after interception. So he was that that's just who he is. Uh, but I think the, one of the keys for Tennessee, they have to win ugly. They have to get that running game going. DeMarco Murray should be back. Uh, they, they still got Derrick Henry. Uh, and the running game's got to be on point. I think that's the only way they can actually win. So I'll, I'm, I'm not, you know, too concerned with Tennessee winning this game. But you just never know. You never know what Kansas City Chiefs team you're going to get. Uh, I think the, the, the key for Kansas City uh, is what, uh, what's the Alex Smith you're going to get? Are you going to get that Alex Smith that played well throughout the week, was an MVP candidate for the first five games, or even the Alex Smith that we know, <laughs> you know, that we know that was in the middle of the year, they went one and six. So, I, you know, you just don't know what team you're going to, you know, what team you're going to get. Their defense is not that, it's not that good, really. Can you turn them into a one dimensional team and let make Alex Smith beat you? That's where can he get hot and win two, three games? Possible, but uh, I think those are the keys to the game. Can Alex Smith still become that Alex Smith that you know? Is he going to become the Alex Smith that we saw in the first five, six games? 
Can Andy Reid coach a great playoff game and not get brain locked and call timeouts and not have any timeouts at the end of the game? At the end of the game, and in Tennessee, can Marcus Mariota really take that next step and really show that, okay, this was just a, a blip in my development, and can I beat this team? But I think their running game's got to be on point, so I think those are the keys to the games um, for both teams. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I have the keys to the game the same for both teams. Both teams have to run the ball, yeah, and they have to stop the run from the other team. Like, this game, is these teams... We think of Kansas City is a lot better than Tennessee, but they're very similar in a lot of ways. When you think about the fact that they depend on their running game, they want to get play action, get the ball downfield off their running game, and they have quarterbacks who have shown glimpses of being good but haven't been consistently great. And with Tennessee, Marcus Mariota this year, for some reason, just can't throw the ball to the right team. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I don't know if he's colorblind. We need to get him tested. But my man cannot throw the ball to the right team. And no. tennis, <laughs> and with Alex Smith, if they don't have Kareem Hunt going off, if he's not getting 100-plus yards and creating that eight-man front for Alex Smith to be able to throw the ball downfield, Alex Smith is not throwing that ball downfield when it's not perfect situation. Like, if the guy's not wide open, when I say wide open, I mean wide open downfield, Alex Smith's not throwing that ball. So now, when you don't have that running game, you have a lot of checkdowns, a lot of five-yard and less passes, which makes your offense a lot less dynamic and a lot more predictable. So this game, I think it go either way, to be honest with you, because I don't think either team is really that good. I don't think the AFC is really that good at all this year. And both of these teams are teams that have benefited from playing in a weak AFC. Tennessee, we saw, once they started playing real competition, they almost fell out the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> and... With Kansas City, it went through a whole part in the middle of the year where they they lost like what seven, six out of seven games. Yeah, so yep. both of these teams can be very bad. <laughs> Hopefully, they show up and they're good for this playoff game. But usually, you have the worst playoff game scheduled first and on Saturday, yeah. and that's why yep. these two teams are scheduled first because we all know what we're going to get. And I'm actually going to go with Tennessee in the upset in this one. I got Tennessee winning mm-hmm. twenty one to twenty. What is your prediction on this one? I actually think Kansas City's going to win this game. As I said, I don't think Tennessee is just not a good team. I, I don't believe in their coach, uh, Mike Malarkey. And the thing with him, too, if Tennessee, he, okay, they got to the playoff, they're 9-7. Um, but I just think they, they got they got a couple breaks here and there because, like the Mariota just hasn't progressed. And this is a time when players like like Mar- uh, Marks Mariota, guys like that, they, this is where they would need to step up. Kansas City's got the experience. Um, they've been to the playoffs. Andy Reid's been to the playoffs multiple times. I think he'll have them ready. And you're right, that's a good point with the Kareem Hunt. Um, if they have to run the football, uh, they still got Travis Kelsey. Uh, they got weapons, so can Tennessee stop them? And if Alex Smith gets time, he can dissect them apart. I mean, Kansas City did beat a couple of good teams, uh, throughout their season and like you said they have they've had an up and down year. They beat the Eagles, they beat New England, they beat the Chargers and, you know, they lost to the Steelers and, you know, looking at the schedule, they lost to the Steelers in a very close one too. So they can actually get on a run. But I have them winning. I said it's gonna be one of those ugly games. I got uh Kansas City beating them seventeen to ten. Okay. I can see it going either way. So like I said, I can't argue with your pick too much because with these teams being so inconsistent we have no idea where we're gonna get on Saturday. <laughs> now, for the next matchup, Saturday night, this should be a good game, man. We have the Atlanta Falcons going to the L.A. Rams. What are your keys to this matchup for both teams? Yeah, this is a real good game. I think this this might be the best game um, of the weekend. Um, you know, I think uh, Atlanta, they, they scraped in. They did what they needed to do to get in. I mean, they had a, a tough road. I mean, they've been inconsistent especially on offense, uh, losing, uh, you know, losing their offensive coordinator. uh, And then it hasn't been, and uh, Matt Ryan hasn't been the same at all. Uh, But they, they did enough. They, they got a pretty decent defense. I think it's one of those things they have to run the football as well. Uh, I think running the football, especially in, in the playoffs, get you, can get you far. They have a good, they have good running game led by Devontae Freeman. Uh, I think Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, they, they have to be on the same 
Um, they have to be on the same page. And Julio Jones, he can he can blow he can blow open a game as we saw in the playoffs last season. He can really uh, open up and, and blow open a game. But I think it's the I think it's the year. Of the, I, I like the Rams. I don't know if they're going to win the Super Bowl or get to the Super Bowl. But I really like what they what they bring. We talked about it earlier. We talked about their coach. We talked about you know the, the Jared Goff improving from the bad season last year. Todd Gurley, he he makes a world of a difference being the, the, the not the best running back, one of the top two or three running backs in the league. And Wade Phillips in that defense, he's got that defense playing extremely well. Uh, so I, I, you know, experience matters. So Atlanta does have the experience getting to the Super Bowl. Uh, last year and blowing that. Sorry, Atlanta fans had to, had to bring that up again, <laughs> but you did. You lost a 25 point lead. Um, uh, but, uh, I think the offense is still not clicking. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think those are the keys to the game, um, for the Rams and the Atlanta. Yeah, I have the keys to the game. Atlanta has to run the ball. And the reason they have to run the ball is to keep the Rams' offense off the field. They have to go back to, you don't hear this term too often now, but time of possession. I think will matter a lot in this game. If Atlanta's able to keep the Rams off the field and keep them out of a rhythm, they can win this game. Because I don't see their defense being able to stop that powerful Rams offense. You know, once Ty Gurley gets to going and you have Jared Goff getting the ball to Sammy Watkins and and Cooper Cup, those that could be it could get ugly. Especially in LA. I think they're gonna have a lot of people show up for this playoff game. It might even finally sell out the Coliseum. And this playoff game is going to be crazy. And they're going to have a lot of Atlanta fans there as well because, you know, a lot of people from Atlanta probably move out to L.A. So it's going to be a packed house, crazy environment. I think that if L.A. stops Atlanta from running the ball, they can win this game. They can make them one-dimensional. You double-team Julio, you make Matt Ryan hesitate. And that's the key. You make Matt Ryan hesitate, you make him nervous in that pocket, it leads to bad decisions. We saw it the first time they played the Saints. He threw three picks because Marshawn Lattimore was doing a great job on Julio Jones. He didn't know where to go. Even though he has yeah. Muhammad Sanu, who's a really probably one of the best number two wide receivers in the league. Sanu, I think, has number one type talent. But for some reason, he still trusts in Julio so much. And that's understandable. Julio Jones is arguably the best you know, wide receiver in the league. But when he gets nervous and he doesn't have that running game behind him, we see mistakes happen. I can see that happening in this matchup. I have the Rams winning twenty seven to seventeen. How do you see this one going? I got a similar score to that as well, because I think the Rams they can score anytime they want. And as you said, I don't think Atlanta has uh, the the defense to stop them and it goes to Todd Gurley. We you know, when Gurley's running and, and rolling like that, the Rams are hard to beat and there's they're explosive, so that opens up. The, the the passing game and they can score at will. They're one. Of, they're what Atlanta was last year. If you if you think about it, you know, explosive running game, um, decent receivers can you know can break it can break open any time. Um, Matty Ice was he, he was he was Matty Ice at that time. Now he's not Matty Ice. Melted Ice, <laughs> 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 you know. He, he just it's just something that hasn't been right. That often hasn't been hasn't been right. So, but I got uh, the Rams winning as well. It's going to be rocking. Uh, I got them winning. I think I went in thirty to twenty-three. Um, it's going to be a close game, but I definitely think the Rams will do enough just to just to win high-scoring game. Okay. And before we talk about the next matchup or the Sunday matchups, let's take a trip down Sports Memory Lane or just Memory Lane in this in this aspect. Do you remember where you were on January eighth, two thousand? January 8th, 2000. No. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I do not. Uh, man, nope. <laughs> January 8th, 2000. The reason I bring up that date, that's the last time we saw the Buffalo Bills in the, pl- <laughs> in the playoffs. <laughs> January 8th, 2000. Crazy. Like, the last, yeah. t- the last time the Buffalo Bills in the playoffs... Cash Money Records are still trying to take over for the 9-9 nine, and nine, the 2000. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like, this is a, a very long time ago. Like, people people were pregnant in January 2000. Those kids are seniors in high school right now. This is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> like, just to 
let's bring out some just some some old facts on what was going on in January 2000. The number one show, right. the number one show in the world at that time was Survivor. Wow, <laughs> they're still on. Yeah, they're still on because I'm, I'm, I'm a Survivor fan, so this, they're on like their 34th season or something like that. So that's a long time. Long time. <laughs> The number one song in the country was Smooth by Santana featuring Rob Thomas. Wow. Yeah. It's a, it's a great song. Great song. I still jam out to it when it comes on. That's a great song. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, the movies that came out in January of 2000, you had Next Friday, mm. Save the Last Dance. Okay. <laughs> uh, you had The Hurricane, and a movie with Denzel Washington when he played the boxer who went in jail. Yep, great great yep. movie. And also you had an extremely goofy movie that came out in January 2000. So just to bring you back to wh- where the world was the last time the <laughs> Buffalo Bills <laughs> were in the playoffs. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. I know Bills fans are thinking, I mean, that celebration, you know, yesterday when Baltimore lost to Cincinnati, or, yeah, to Cincinnati, oh my goodness, and I'm, I'm originally from upstate New York, so um, mm. small town, uh, Elmira, it's just three hours away from Buffalo, there's a lot of Bills fans, I know personally a lot of Bills fans, they were excited, 17 years of, of not making the playoffs, man, that, you know, props to them <laughs> and, and that fan base. Definitely, definitely. So we have Buffalo in the playoffs for the first time, like you said, in 17 years, going against Jacksonville. What are your keys to this matchup? Man, the, the Bills, I know they're just excited to be there. Uh, so I think the, the keys to, for them, they had a, an up and down year as well. They they were they started hot. They were just like a typical Buffalo Bills season. Started hot, uh, fell off a little bit. Came back, was winning back and forth. Had Peterman in, had a had a moment of lapse with Peterman throwing five interceptions in a game. The, the rookie, poor guy. I mean, confidence was shot after that. Uh, Ty- Tyron Taylor comes back. They win. They get in. So, uh, but the key to the Bills, I think it, it still goes to Lashawn McCoy. Now he got injured yesterday, ankle injury. They're saying that he's going to um, be able to play, but he's not going to be a hundred percent. Um, and if he's not rolling, the Bills don't roll. It's, it's interesting, you know, the running game, which running backs was a lost art, it's coming back. It's not just about the, the explosive passing, the receivers. It's the running game, but McCoy just brings a different skill set uh, to that offense, uh, such a different dynamic, and he can catch out of the backfield. He's a solid runner. Uh, he's a difference maker. I, I still not, I'm not a believer in Tyrod Taylor. Uh, it could be inaccurate. Um, he can make plays, but I'm just not a believer in him. But, uh, yeah, that, it's the run game. I think they have to – that sets up the play-action pass. Um, and Calvin Benjamin, he, he's making a little bit of a difference. I mean, this, he's he's a number one the, – the Bills number one receiver that their offense lacks. So McCoy is the difference, I think, uh, for this game. If he's healthy and he can run, uh, that will be – that will be uh, – very good for him, but he's going against a, a solid Jacksonville t- defense. Uh, they're they're one of the keys. If they continue to keep playing at a high level, I think they're going to the Jacksonville's going to have to ride them all the way through the, through the playoffs because uh, Blake Bortles is horrible. <laughs> he's a terrible <laughs> quarterback. Uh, we don't know if he's going to throw three picks or he's going to throw for three hundred yards and three touchdowns. That's just the type of player he is, and I think that's. He's the, he's the X factor. Besides the defense, he's the huge X factor. If he plays well, the defense we know is going to play well. They have a chance to win. So I think those are the keys uh, for this matchup. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned the running game because in each of the matchups we talked about so far, the running game is the key. And yeah. this year, the passing game, even though it's still a very pass happy league, has taken kind of a step back. We don't have anybody who was close to throwing five thousand yards. Tom Brady was the leader with 4,500 yards this year. And the leading passing touchdown guy was Russell Wilson with 34. In the past years, we've had 40, 45, 50 touchdowns thrown. And I think that defense has, defenses excuse me, have adjusted to the pass-happy league. And now we're starting to see offense readjust to that and go more to a pounding type attack. That's why you had teams like the Saints who had that two-headed monster now and Buffalo and Jacksonville are being successful, being able to run the rock, even though their quarterbacks aren't the best of the best. 
in this matchup, I think Buffalo has to make Jacksonville one-dimensional. And Leonard Fournette hasn't been that guy we saw early in the year. Early in the year, it seemed like he was going to be somebody who was going to be in the running for rookie of the year. And his name wasn't even mentioned when we did our rookie of the year award earlier. It shows you how much right. he fell off from what he was doing early in the season. So I think that could be something that could happen. Buffalo can shut down Leonard Fournette, make Blake Bortles prove himself to be the quarterback we saw for like that three-week stretch where we're like, okay, is Blake Bortles finally starting to figure it out? But, of course, <laughs> that didn't, you know, it, it came back to normal. He was like, okay, it's it's cool. Because I was like, who's this guy in a Blake Bortles jersey out here throwing these touchdown passes? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because <laughs> it definitely cannot be Blake out here doing this. But I think the key is for Buffalo to make Jacksonville one-dimensional, make Blake beat him. For Jacksonville, they have to make Buffalo one-dimensional. Make Tyrod Taylor beat him. But I believe in Tyrod Taylor more than I believe in Blake Bortles because Tyrod Taylor may not win the game for you, but he's not going to lose the game for you. That's true. He has a great touchdown interception ratio. He rarely throws bad passes where you're like, man, where was he looking at? Blake Bortles throws those passes all the time. You're like, what were you doing, Blake? What did you see there? So because of that, Jacksonville could be a team that could win and upset Pittsburgh or, well, they had to play Pittsburgh regardless. So they could upset Pittsburgh in the next game. They beat Pittsburgh earlier this year. So they're dangerous if they win. But I'm going with the upset. I think Buffalo, after all this time out of the playoffs, they come in and make some noise. I got Buffalo winning 17-14. What's your prediction for this matchup? Wow. Um, it would be nice if Buffalo can get um, can get hot and get on that run and upset Jacksonville. I think it's going to just be too much of a tall order for them. Um, just because, like I said, if McCoy, they say he'll be ready. I don't know if he's going to be 100%. And he's playing against uh, like uh, one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in football, with the Jaguars. And as you said, the Jaguars they they beaten teams uh, like they beat Baltimore, they whipped Baltimore, they whipped Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. Um, so I think Jacksonville will win. It's going to be closer than, um, than than I know people might think it's going to be a blowout, but it's because of the. Blake Bortles factor. We don't know what type of good guy we're going to get. I don't believe in him either, uh, but it, I think they got to run the football as well. Uh, but I think their defense will make a play. Uh, so I, I have it like 19 13 uh, Jacksonville in a close, ugly game. And I think their defense will make a couple of key plays to, to win the game. No, I definitely can see that happening as well. Like I said, with these AFC matchups, man, we definitely don't, just don't have no idea. What's going to yeah. happen <laughs> at all? So now let's move on to the marquee matchup of the weekend. Got <laughs> Carolina going to New Orleans. This is the one rematch we have this weekend. This te- these two teams, of course, are divisional rivals, have played each other twice. And in those two matchups, the Saints won pretty easily. The Saints won the first matchup 34-13, the second matchup 31-21. And in both matchups, they weren't really close. There weren't times where Saints fans or the Saints felt nervous about losing those games. And in those two games, the Saints were able to move the ball up and down the field. And they were able to throw the ball in those games exceptionally well against the Panthers secondary. Cam Newton struggled, especially in the first game. He threw three picks against the Saints. In the second game, he only had 180 yards passing. And they pretty much had no running game. So, it's very hard to be a team three times in a row. Right? Any team. Let alone a team that's good like Carolina. So, it does make me nervous as a Saints fan had to play them again. But I'm glad it's in the dome. And because of that, I think that the Saints, keys for the Saints will be passing the ball. They've been running the ball all year. It's been their mantra this year. But I think for them, this game comes down to them being able to pass the ball. And because they're playing in the dome, they're playing in that environment where it's going to be super loud for Carolina to be able to do anything. I think the Saints have to pass the ball and then start running the ball once they get a lead. Establish the pass first then go with the run, have Mark Ingram wear him down at the end. So that means Michael Thomas has to play a big part in this game. Shout out to Michael Thomas, man. Well, he's very under-talked about. We talk about great receivers in this league. Has the most receptions in the history of the league in his first two years playing, which is crazy. So it's big. So Michael Thomas, Willie Sneed, Brandon Coleman, Alvin Kamara, of course, in the past game as well. It's up to those guys to make the game fast and make Carolina just confuse them and have them, you know, just not not ready to play. And for Carolina, they have to slow that down. 
They have to be ready to slow down the pass game and make it to where the Saints have to run the ball, where it's not just a luxury. And Cam Newton. Cam Newton has to show up. They're not going to be able to win this game with Cam Newton throwing for 140 and running for 60 yards. He needs to throw up, show up in the passing game. And he has to pass for at least 240, 260, a couple touchdowns for the running game to even work. If he's not passing the ball, at least for those yards, you don't get the Christian McCaffrey and Jonathan Stewart combo to work. If that combo is not working, they're not working. But I'm going with the Saints in this matchup. I'm going 31 to 20 Saints. What are your keys and your prediction for this one? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with everything you said. Um, with the Saints, um, playing at home, playing a, a familiar foe um, in Carolina, which he said that they beat. They've already, you know, they beat them, t- uh, you know, two, no- two, two nothing um, with a record. So they know that they can beat these guys probably any time. And being at home, the Saints are still a dominant team. They're still a dangerous team at home in that home at Loud Dome. And, they're, you know, they're back in the playoffs. And they have, to, to me, it, you know, like, They've gotten away from their explosive passing game, but they can just go out there and say, okay, yeah, we have the the one-two punches, Kamara and Ingram. We have a young defense. I think that that's a that's a, a key. Can that young defense still make plays and play well enough to get on a run? But they have the best quarterback in the NFC in Drew Brees. They, oh, forgot. Oh, yeah, we got Drew Brees. <laughs> like, yes, we still got this guy. We still got the future Hall of Famer, one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, a guy that, you know, has, has just thrown for so many yards and his uh, stats have been off the charts over those these, these last 10 years. Yeah, we could pull this guy out and he can actually ride out, ride this thing out if we struggle with all these other aspects of the game. Um, I, I, like I said, he's the best quarterback in the NFC. He's better, he's better than Cam, Matt Ryan. You got guys like Nick Foles, backup quarterbacks, Case Keenum, um, you know, and Jared Goff, another guy that you know, a second-year player has never been in the playoffs, so that leaves Drew Brees, a guy that's won a Super Bowl too. So I think he's the he's the key. He's the he's the key um, to, to their success in this game. If he's rolling, as you said, they open up the pass first, which I think they're going to do because I think they know Carolina's probably going to adjust and try to stop the run. But like I said, you got Drew Brees. As and he he still makes plays, and I think they did save him for this moment to to lead this team. So uh, I think that he's the he's the key. I think for Carolina, as you said, uh, it's 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 all about Cam. It's it's all about Cam Newton. What Cam Newton are you going to get? Are you going to get the guy that can make plays with his arms and his legs, or are you going to get the guy that that throws for 140 yards and throws three four picks as well? Um, because Carolina, when they're rolling, it goes to their their front seven making plays. Cam Newton making plays to you know Greg Olson or to the, the running back uh, Christian McCaffrey. So uh, can can Cam? Yeah, can he turn it around? He because he had a bad yeah, yesterday he had a real bad game, but his ability to make plays and when Britt things break down, he's dangerous. And it's the passing game. I think that's the key for them to beat New Orleans. I don't think they're going to beat New Orleans. I think New Orleans will beat them again. As you said, it's hard to beat a team three times. I know the Cowboys did this years ago against the Eagles, beat them back-to-back, beat them in the last game of the season, and then beat them in the playoffs as well. So it can be done. Um, familiar foes, they're in the same conference, uh, same division. So, But I got New Orleans winning. I got a 34-23 Saints. Yeah, like I said, it's it's tough to do. Especially when you got a team like Carolina, who is dynamic when they're playing well, but with Cam Newton, for some reason against the Saints, he hasn't been dynamic this year, and their running game hasn't been good against the Saints either. And I think it's because we're able to shut down our pass game, so it makes them one dimensional. We know the run is coming, and when you know something is coming, it makes it easier for you to stop it, of course. So that's why I got the Saints winning this matchup. So that was our breakdown of the Wild Card Weekend. Looking for exciting football, unpredictable football. We disagree on the AFC matchups. We're eye to eye on the NFC matchups. And that just lets you know how unpredictable the AFC is. How inconsistent these teams that are playing in the wild card weekend are for the AFC. So now it's time for 
my my baby right here, man. It's my favorite part of the show. I call it for, <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten Players. Not going to do sports trivia this week. We got Forgotten Players. And Forgotten Players is where we pay homage to players who may have not been may have not been great but very good or maybe were great but not recognized or players who you just have forgotten about who we want to remind you of. So who is your Forgotten Player today, Courtney? Yeah, I love this uh I love this uh, uh, segment of the show as well. Uh, I just love to see who who your guests pick and who you pick uh, as your forgotten player. But since this was an NFL themed um, show, I wanted to go with a, a you know former NFL player. Uh, he played for the Eagles. He played for the Tennessee Titans. I'm gonna go with the Javon Curse, the Freak. Uh, probably haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know he he definitely was a. Played 11 seasons during the 90s and late 90s and 2000s. Uh, played college in uh, Florida, received All-American honors, drafted in 1999 by the Titans. Played for my beloved Eagles. I mean, he was a beast, uh, defensive end. Made play, was a big playmaker. Uh, just don't think he got that that push. But, I mean, look at some of his uh, highlights. A three-time Pro Bowler. Uh, he was defensive player of the year in 99. Um, also, uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, he won an SEC championship, go back to college. Uh, you know, he was an impact player. He had 74 sacks for his career. He said played 11 seasons. Uh, so, yeah, my, my uh, uh, forgotten player is Javon Curse, the Freak. That's a very good forgotten player. Somebody who, like you said, when you get the nickname the Freak, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know you are an absolute beast. Especially because the NFL is full of freaks. Like, it's full of people who are freakishly athletic. And for you to stand out as the freak among freaks, that means you, <laughs> that That's you're, true. Yeah, you're, you're definitely a beast out there. Now, for my forgotten player, this guy, he had a good college career. His pro career wasn't that good. But he kept getting a lot of chances because he was somebody who just looked the part. And we mentioned earlier the Buffalo Bills last playoff game, which was January 8th, 2000. The Music City Miracle. Mm. Still can hear the call in my head. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Is it a forward lateral? Is it, you know, <laughs> did he pass it back? Yes. <laughs> so, a lot of memories from that game. A lot of people don't remember who was the starting quarterback for the Bills in that game. It was not Doug Flutie. It was Rob Johnson. And that's my forgotten player today. Rob Johnson was 6'4", 200-pound quarterback out of USC. He was the 99th overall pick in the 1995 NFL draft by the Jacksonville Jaguars. He went 12-17 and 17 as a starter. He did have a pretty decent completion rate at 61%. For his career, threw for 5,795 yards, 30 touchdowns, and 23 interceptions. But he's most remembered for being a part of that QB controversy with Buffalo. Do we go with Doug Flutie? Do we go with Rob Johnson? Mm-hmm. And he decided to go with Rob Johnson because he was more the prototypical guy, even though Doug Flutie, Doug Flutie had a magic like, with him. He had something about Doug Flutie made him win games. He was undersized. He just, <laughs> but somehow he was able to maneuver around. He was kind of like, right. he was Johnny Manziel before Johnny Manziel in college, right? He was the guy <laughs> that was that undersized guy who made things happen with his feet. But they went with Rob Johnson. And even in that year, the year 2000 or the year 99, he didn't. His stats weren't the best, but in 2000 was his best year with the Buffalo Bills. He went four and seven, 57 percent completion rate, 2,125 yards passing, 12 touchdowns, seven interceptions. So he had an up and down career for his nine seasons. But that's my forgotten player today, Rob Johnson. So shout out to Rob Johnson and Javon Kurtz as wow. our forgotten players today. So again, man, I'm very appreciative of you coming on the show. And I'm urging people to go listen to The Real Deal with Courtney Harden. Where can people listen to it? And when can they listen to it? Absolutely. We uh, Thanks again for uh, letting me jump on the show. I've uh, been, you know, had a, took a, took a break from the, uh, from the podcast on uh, the last three weeks for the holidays. So uh, now I'm back. I'm going to be refreshed. New show on Saturday. Uh, this Saturday, you can check it out on blogtalkradio.com slash Momentum Shift uh, as the network and the website. And then you can check out the replay of the show on demand, going for two dot com slash Momentum Shift. Also, you can follow the show on Twitter at Get the Real Deal. 
Uh, again, like I said, I you know have a lot of guests. Damien's been a part of the show, been a part of the Momentum Shift uh, shows as well. So shout outs to uh, all those guys there, uh, the Red Zone and the Study Hall. Uh, but yeah, just um, now with 2018, I'll be back this Saturday. I'm trying, we're definitely trying to get you on the next couple of weeks uh, with boxing coming up as well. You know, some of the big fights this season, uh, this this year. Uh, so yeah, definitely um, check out the show and again, thank you for letting me come on the show. Yeah, man, it's no problem. I appreciate you coming on. You're always a great guest. Always bring knowledge. And if you listen to his show, you can hear anything, man. You can hear a sermon. Like when Kelly, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when he had Kelly and Rashawn on from the Red Zone Live, they were talking about the Philadelphia Eagles, and it was right after the Wentz injury. When Kelly got finished talking about how the Eagles have to keep their positive vibes, the fans have to believe, I almost became an Eagles fan. I was like, oh, man, this is, <laughs> she went to church on the real, the real deal with Courtney Harden. So, like I said, he always has great guests like that, always bring a great commentary. And not only knows, you know, basketball, football, also knows boxing, UFC. So make sure you guys go check out The Real Deal with Courtney Harden. And make sure you follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat now. I'm finally joining the Snapchat world. So at, okay. <laughs> at The Real Deal WDA, that's The Real Deal, W as in Whiskey, D as in Delta, A as in Alpha, on all platforms you can follow me. And make sure you tell your friends about The Real Deal with Damian Adams. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker Radio, and the Three Point Conversion Station. Also available on YouTube. Full episodes are now available on YouTube as well. And you can catch everything on YouTube. Funny videos of me dancing. If the Saints lose, it's funny videos of me, you know, maybe crying if the Saints lose this weekend. So you can get anything on the YouTube channel, The Real Deal with Damian Adams. So just follow The Real Deal with Damian Adams and The Real Deal with Courtney Harden everywhere. And you'll be fine in your sports talk world. You'll have all the sports you need by following those shows. Of course, also the Red Zone Live with Kelly and Rashawn. Shout out to them. You can still catch our bonus episode where we did a sports movie draft and go vote on that. That was a very fun episode. Very funny. Yeah. Go check that one out. Good show. Thank very you. Funny thank show. you. I, I love that show, man. Like <laughs> I said, when we, when we all get together, man, you know, the real deal and uh, the Red Zone Live, man, we, we always... Uh, cut it up man. <laughs> so yes yeah, good, good, good times man <laughs> definitely definitely so go check that one out as well and until next time go real or go home <laughs>